Okay guys, congratulations. You've built your boat and we're on to the last stages. We're going to finish the boat. Uh, however you paint it, it's going to be required before you put the electronics and rig the boat. Now, painting can be one of the most challenging aspects of building the T-37. I, the reason I say that is it requires a lot of technique and it requires a lot of patience. Um, you may be wondering what I have this gallon of acetone out here for. I'm actually going to do a demonstration that's going to seem insane and I would never do this on anything other than the linear polyurethane. In this case this happens to be all grip. But I've wiped this with acetone and this is real acetone, it's not a prop. But you can wipe acetone on a linear polyurethane and it isn't affected. That would not be true of, say, the varnish that I have on the stand that I built. The varnish um, has its own challenges. Uh, varnish can certainly be beautiful. This is not a varnish on the deck, by the way. This is also a clear linear polyurethane. But this is a matte finished varnish. It's about 15 coats uh, sprayed on there. Believe it or not, uh, there's about 95% of one quart that was used for getting this finish on here. It's completely filled in all the grain. So anyway, we're going to talk about this and uh, what trade-offs you're going to get with different types of finishes and also brushing versus spraying and that sort of thing in a little bit. But anyway, I did want to get you acquainted with this and do this one demonstration. So again, congratulations and we'll see you in a few. Okay guys, let's get ready to make some colors, why don't we? Before we get started on that though, I thought I would ask a couple of things and get you thinking along the lines of what does it take to make a really nice shiny surface. So what, do, what is the most important thing? Is it going to be best brush, nice air gun, um, what? Well, it's kind of a trick question because the first thing is you. You've got to decide, am I going to do the work required to get a shiny finish? It doesn't happen overnight, and I can guarantee it doesn't happen in one coat, doesn't happen in two coats. It requires several coats. So, having decided that and said, you know, well, I do want a shiny finish and I'm going to spend the time, well then what is the most important thing after that? Again, another trick question. The answer to that is actually sandpaper. You're going to become really good friends with your sanding blocks. Sandpaper is the real thing required to get a good finish. Now there's plenty of techniques, there's plenty of different paints. In fact, why don't we look at what uh, wood grain is and why that's important. So here, doesn't this look like a block of wood? This is an end grain. This is like this block of cedar and this is going to be all the cellulose fibers of the wood. It's like a bundle of soda straws. Now when this went from a tree to a piece of lumber someone cut this across the top and what happened is all of these wood cells became exposed at the surface and what's going to happen is when it gets painted it's going to go in the little valleys fill the straws and you're going to have a rough finish so with your first coat of paint once it hardens you'll see all of these wood grains are you done don't even think about it you're not close after you've done that the next thing to do is going to be to get your sandpaper and you're going to sand the highs off of that and you're going to go with your next coat and it's going to follow this but not nearly as bumpy as it was before when that hardens you're going to sand this off sand the peaks off of that and then you're going to go <clears throat> with another layer and that's going to be a lot smoother basically you have to fill all of these wood cells in order to get a smooth surface. Put another way, you need to have the surface looking like plastic before you paint it to get a good gloss. 
if you see any wood grain showing, when you put the gloss on there, you're going to see it in the gloss. So, how do we do that? <clears throat> well, if you're going to be varnishing, the only way to do it is just multiple layers of thin varnish. Put one on top of the other, sand it in between coats. Sorry, but there's no fillers that's going to work on that. You have to keep it clear. If you're going to paint with an enamel, however, there are some options. So let's cover those, why don't we? Now, a while back I painted this as a demonstration for one of our annual meetings at the T-37s. And what this is, a block, this is a block of wood that shows a progression on how to get a shiny finish. And I don't know if this is going to show up particularly well for you. But we start out with a bare wood. This happens to be more of a lumber grade akumi, so it's got very open cells. But I went to the car store and I wanted to show that it was possible to get a very nice finish using rattle can paints. This is a sandable primer. Very important. It comes in multiple colors, but I want it to contrast with the final colors. I was using white since I was going to be painting this with black. So anyway, this dries very quickly. It is a sandable primer. So the first coat was applied very thick, but you can definitely see lots of wood grain. So this was sanded off. Hmm, feels pretty good. I sanded it with uh, 220 grit. And then here, in fact, let me do it the other way. <clears throat> here I applied a second coat, sanded that. Third coat, sanded that. Finally, this started to look like plastic. The reason for that, we had sanded all of the grain off and all that was left was the primer. So then we went into the glosses. Uh, I'll get into this more later, but basically the only way to get a good finish is several layers that are thin. So this was like a light mist coat. First coat you put on there is going to be pretty transparent. The next coats really are not much heavier than that at all, but you're applying thin layers uh, and multiple layers of that. If you try and do it in one coat, you're going to fail. You're going to look, it's not going to look as good as you wanted it to. It may have runs and sags. So trust me, you want to do thin layers. You want to sand it. We'll get into that a little bit more, but mainly I wanted to show you this is what sanding primers are all about. Now I'm going to give you a thought experiment on this. <clears throat> I know you've been mixing epoxy and mixing thickeners in it. Now, the way these work is that a sanding primer is essentially just putty that's been thinned. So you've made epoxy putty before. You mix your resin and your hardener. Then you mix the brown powder and you get a thick putty. When you've added enough of the brown powder, you can smear it. You can hang it on a wall. It's not going to sag down. It becomes like peanut butter. All right. So let's say you took that nice thick putty that'll hang on a wall like peanut butter and you added a bunch of acetone to it and thinned it down and stirred it until it was kind of watery. You could spray that, put that in a paint sprayer, spray it on the wall. When the acetone evaporates, you're back to a putty. Now, two things to note here. There are two things happening. The first is evaporation. So the acetone, when you spray it against the wall, will evaporate pretty quickly and what's left is the putty. Now that does not mean the reaction has happened yet. So the hardener is still mixing with the resin. So you still have a soft putty, but you've, list, you've lost all of the solvent, which has made it runny. So this is exactly what an epoxy primer is. It has a lot of solvent. And when you mix the A and the B parts, you'll end up with a, part, uh, with a paint that's pretty thick. You add thinners to it and spray it. Now that's like an epoxy. Um, right here I've got some Interlux Epoxy Barrier Coat. Wonderful stuff. It's 404 and 414 uh, is the uh, mix. But there are a number of epoxy uh, sandable primers. I have yet to have one that isn't a good product. They're all good. <clears throat> now, contrast that to the car paint. 
we don't have a hardener to mix with the resin. All we have is an enamel. By the way, an enamel means it's an oxidization reaction. So you spray this on and it has to mix with some uh, oxygen in order to harden. That's a chemical reaction. What happens when you spray it on is it evaporates just like with this and then it becomes thicker and the chemical reaction makes it harden. Now, this is pretty good stuff. It's not as good as this though. This you can apply a single coat and you're going to build it up pretty quickly. Here you'd have to apply several different coats. And it continues to shrink. And I don't know if you can see this, but uh, this initially was very much like a glass finish. It was beautiful. But you can start seeing after a year that some of the wood grain is showing through. I think if you stuck it in an oven uh, just with like a wall heater and got it to 120 degrees for 24 hours, you'd probably get the rest of the solvents out. But anyway, this can cost about four or five bucks. I got it in a Napa uh, car parts place. I think you can get it any hardware or any car parts place. And so it's very easy to get this stuff, not very expensive and about the right size. You might need two cans for your boat. This is harder to get. Uh, you can see I have a gallon kit and it was and, uh, $110 I think. And you also have to have some solvent. So clearly this is way, way more than you need unless you happen to be painting your 37 foot boat in addition to your 37 inch boat. So the epoxy primers are strictly a way of building up very quickly all the interstices in these wood grains and uh, wood cells so that you can sand it, apply it, sand it, apply it, sand it, apply it, very quickly build up because all this is is putty. It's putty with a thinner but that's what it is. Okay? So we're going to go on and talk about some other uh, techniques and some other types of materials but that's the lowdown on epoxy sanding primers and uh, enamel sandable primers, okay? So we'll meet you in the next meeting. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Okay, all you painters out there, our T37s are rocking and rolling now, so you got to be excited about that. Well, we need to make some decisions about what kind of finish we're going to have. Are we going to varnish it? Are we going to make an enamel? Are we going to make it uh, opaque? What are we going to do with it? Well, probably you're going to want it shiny. I'm going to go out on a limb here and just make that guess. What do you want to do with that, though? Okay, many of you are going to have a varnish deck. So let's talk about that. Here I have probably my favorite varnish around. It's Epiphanes Varnish and the Epiphanes Thinner. <clears throat> this is an excellent system. It comes from Holland. It's not cheap, but it goes on beautifully. It levels beautifully. It's a wonderful working varnish. You can get it at West Marine. You can also get it at other marine supply stores. Another one is, uh, perhaps surprisingly, West Marine Varnish. It's their spar varnish, but it happens to be made by Epiphanes. So it happens to have pretty much all the same properties, and it's uh, probably 20% less expensive. So you might try the West Marine Varnish. Another one that I've had a lot of good luck with is the International Spar Varnish. I think it's called Gold, Gold Spar. Uh, beautiful stuff. Also works very well. <clears throat> they all require a bit of thinning, but if you follow the instructions, you will get a great finish. Now, I will tell you one of the great secrets of varnishing. So let's say you're varnishing your deck. It's here flat on the table, so you could put it on a quarter inch thick and you're not going to get any runs and sags, right? Wrong. Here's what happens. You end up trapping solvents in the uh, varnish and it never hardens. Varnishes must be applied with thin layers. Uh, does this mean just barely on, you know, just sort of hold it up and blow the vapors across the deck. No. You can apply it uh, with a brush and get a nice even wet coat, but do not try and see how much you can apply. You will fail. Does it sound like I've tried it? Oh yeah. Have I ever made it work? No. So, 
take advantage of my experience and just don't do it, okay? Now, moving on to the simplest form of color. I got this at the car parts place and maybe it's a little shinier than others because it's supposed to match a car finish. Maybe not. <clears throat> but it doesn't get any simpler than just taking a rattle can and rattling it around and spritzing it on there. You can actually get excellent results. You really can. But it's very technique uh, dependent. Another thing is while you're on your way to West Marine or your Marine store, this is Interlux Bright Side Polyurethane Enamel. It's really nice stuff. It applies well, it sprays well, it brushes well, it does everything nicely, and it comes in a small can, so you're not going to spend a lot of money on a can that you're just not going to have any use for. So uh, this is good stuff, but I think there may be also some Pettit products and um, several other uh, manufacturers of marine finishes that are just equally as good. Uh, but this is very nice stuff and I have applied it to 1T37 with excellent results. Always go with a solvent they recommend. <clears throat> There's a reason for this. Now just like with the varnish, uh, the enamels can be thinned with something other than the uh, paint thinner that they recommend for you to use. But very often there are surfactants, which are surface modifiers that alter the surface tension that they apply into the solvent that you do not get with mineral spirits or acetone or something like that. The thinner they supply was designed to do something very specific. Maybe they wanted it to dry faster than MEK, or maybe they wanted it to dry slower than acetone. Maybe it's a blend. But uh, it's okay to clean your uh, brushes, it's okay to clean your equipment with other thinners, but when you're applying the paint, use their recommended products. Finally, we're getting to the linear polyurethane. This is all grip, uh, like uh, Sterling, uh, Emron, those sorts of things are called linear polyurethanes. What's the difference? This is a polyurethane. Well, this has an oxidation reaction that finds an oxygen molecule to harden. It has solvents that evaporate, but the reaction is caused by oxygen. Here we have a crosslinker. This is also called a converter. So a molecule here has to find a molecule in the paint. When they find each other, a reaction is going to happen. It'll turn to a solid. Solvent is in there also. So when you apply it, with the solvent and the thinner, the thinner will be applied and mixed with the paint. When you apply it to the surface, the thinner evaporates out and the reaction continues to happen. So, <clears throat> this is showing you all the ingredients required. We have our thinner, uh, also called reducer. We have the base coat. We have the converter. And then we've got a catalyst. This just makes the reaction happen faster. It's very handy in cooler temperatures. Um, but the point is, is that this requires more additives. And in fact, there's one other that's an option. I didn't show it because generally you don't need it. But you can get another additive that helps it flow better called a fisheye additive. So this is probably $150 uh, worth of material. This is probably five or six dollars. If you can go to a boat, uh, uh, boat yard or maybe car finishing place, you can probably pick up this same stuff very inexpensively. So that's pretty much it. All of these can be applied with a brush. All can be applied with a sprayer. So it just depends on what you want to use. We'll talk about that in another installment, okay? We'll see you guys later. Okay guys, I thought I'd take a couple of minutes to discuss exactly what it is we're talking about when we say we're doing a fine finish. Now to me that means that we have sanded and we have painted enough coats of varnish or paint to where we actually have made the wood grain disappear. Now of course we also do not want to have bugs in the surface and we don't want to have sags, runs, brush strokes, that sort of thing. 
So I thought I'd show a model that I did a while back. This is a boat designed by John Alden in 1913 called Shirley. It's a Q-class boat. And in this model, the top sides are western red cedar and the bottom is Alaskan yellow cedar. Both of those are very porous woods. In particular, the western red is very porous and soaks up a lot of varnish. So it's very important that you put enough coats of varnish on there to seal all the wood grain. So here is uh, showing you what this could look like. Now in this case, the base has 12 coats of, of epiphane varnish and the model itself has about 15 coats. The base is uh, western maple with a fiddleback pattern in it and in the middle it's uh, South American pearwood. Now the top sides, are, excuse me, all of the uh, model itself is about 15 coats of varnish. <clears throat> Again, that's all epiphanes. So you can see that it's flowed out beautifully. There is no wood grain that's apparent on it anywhere. And I was lucky enough to, not to have any kamikaze bugs. Now all that's keeping you from having a finish like this is deciding to sand and put enough layers of varnish on to where it flows out and it'll be shiny like this. All I'm asking you to do is do exactly what you've been doing, just do more of it. All right, we'll talk to you later. Okay, all you yachtsmen out there, I thought I'd contrast the finishing of the T37 that I did in all grip uh, to the varnish that I showed before. Now, what does it take to go from a T37 that's like this, that has all this putty, to a T37 like this, that's done in all grip? And first off, I wanted to describe the finish of this boat. And the deck was a little unusual. I actually made a deck out of western red cedar and Alaskan yellow cedar strip, sanded it, laminated it to 132nd inch plywood, and then put a layer of 1.3 ounce fiberglass cloth over the top. This finish is not varnish. It's all all grip. So it gives a very smooth surface, <clears throat> but it tends to be a little less uh, forgiving, I think, than varnish. But with the fiberglass on top to keep it from checking, it gives a very tough surface. So again, this is about 12 layers of all grip, but you can see there's no hint of wood grain showing through, although I have noticed that the lighter colored Alaskan yellow is shrinking just a little bit. But I'm going to go out on a limb here and say it probably doesn't slow me down in the races. Anyway, uh, the top sides are done and the bottom with three layers of international 404 slash 414 epoxy primer. Each of those layers were sanded and then sprayed and in the end the finish looked more like plastic. There was no wood grain showing through. So in this case, uh, just like with the deck, all of the wood grain has disappeared. But you can see it has a very nice high shine, great reflection, great depth, and uh, really looks great. But all of that is from the primer. It's much more of the primer than it is from the uh, paint itself. Anyway, so again, you can do this. All you have to do is be prepared to do some sanding and apply several coats, okay? Okay, all you painters and varnishers there, uh, we're getting ready to do a brushed on varnish onto the T37. Now, I've only got one T37, so I'm going to be using this as uh, in its stead. It's a piece of western red cedar. And let's go ahead and apply some varnish right up, okay? Got some varnish. Um, looks a little bit chunky, so I'm going to thin it out a bit. Okay. 
Okay. Well, that's got about uh, the whole thing coated. So what would you think about that? I hope you guys caught that this was actually uh, a complete farce because there are ten things that I did that are wrong. First thing is, uh, as I told you in the first chapter, you do not put your rag against the acetone. Now this was an empty one, so this was a shill, but you pour into the rag. Second thing was, here I was sanding and I put a dusty tool down on the work surface, and the work surface itself was dusty from the sanding. And if you just look at it, it looks like it's uh, maybe something less than surgical room clean. Uh, we also had a dusty boat. I mean, I kind of wiped it off with a paper towel, but that was it. Uh, we also had old varnish. This was literally old varnish that I had in a jar, and it is kind of chunky. Uh, we also had unfiltered varnish. Sometimes if you have varnish that you're wondering about, you can filter it and get rid of some of the chunks. Now, normally you would also want to pour into a paper cup because you, if you just brush out of your can, you're going to put dust back into your can as you're going along. So as you get towards the bottom of your can, it's getting dirtier and dirtier. Uh, the other thing was, I used an incorrect thinner. This was mineral spirits, and I'll clean up a, uh, a brush with that stuff, but I would not use that for the thinner because, as I said before, the uh, proper thinners that the company recommends may have surface modifying agents called surfactants to help it flow. Um, another thing was, this was a very sloppy stroke. I just did this. Now I know that many people, if not most people, do that. That is incorrect. Tenth thing was the dusty clothes. I have dust on the clothes and they're falling onto this finish. That's no good. And the last thing was, this is a chip brush uh, or disposable brush. It happens to be a better quality one than most but it's still a disposable brush. You want to spend a couple of bucks and get a brush that is specifically for varnish or for enamels and varnish. You do not want to get an all-purpose. You do not want to get a latex one. So we're going to rewind this and we're going to start doing this the right way. I'm going to go ahead and clean this up, but I really wanted to show you the very common mistakes that many people use uh, or that do and uh, we're going to start over, and we're going to do it right this time, okay? Okay, guys, we're getting ready to do some real varnishing here. So in the previous chapter, I showed you how not to do the varnishing. So how about this time I show you how we really do it, okay? Anyway, first thing is we're going to clean the surface. Now, this is a degreaser. <coughs> You could use uh, the uh, paint thinner, the mineral spirits. This happens to be dedicated for it. And this is just something that is used to clean the surface. It gets rid of any oily residues. So we're going to wipe that down first. And we do want to give it just a little bit of time. This is actually the slow type. There's a faster type also. But generally I like the slow. So this has now cleaned our work surface. I'm going to start letting this uh, dry. Now here is my favorite varnish, the Epiphanes. <coughs> it's the clear gloss. <coughs> We're just going to pour out enough for this evening's work, which really isn't going to be that much, okay? Now they recommend for the first coat a 50% thinning. So we want to reduce this down by about 50%. And this is the recommended Epiphanes brushing thinner. And it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. But in general, I found that the manufacturers would just as soon give you correct instructions for the best finish 
So in general, it's a pretty good rule to follow their instructions. Now, the other thing I'm going to talk to you about is the brush. I know I told you before that uh, I had used a throwaway brush, <clears throat> which was incorrect. Now, the other thing is I should have said that was also too small, and that was intentional. A one-inch brush is a little marginal on that. I like the one-and-a-half inch. I also like the beveled one. This is like a 15-degree bevel. This is a varnish brush, and you can see that it's well used. You can also see that I actually use this. You do want to keep the uh, package that this comes in because when you get done, if you do not put this brush back into the container and wrap it up, the fibers or the bristles will start splaying on you. So, after every use, you want to clean it very thoroughly. You want to put it back into its case and close it up to keep your brush in good condition. Another thing you may want to try is that after every, I don't know, maybe a half a dozen brushings and uses of this, you start getting a buildup of varnish up here or paint. And you can get this stuff called uh, brushing conditioner. Uh, and this brush conditioner is something that is generally water soluble. You leave your brushes in overnight. You do not let it sit in the bottom because that messes up your bristles. But you hang it into this brush conditioner and the next day all the old varnish and paint will have loosened up and you can take it out with a, like a wire comb and then your brush is just about like new. Okay, the next thing that we want to do <clears throat> is this is a tack cloth. Any paint company or any hardware store will have a tack cloth. So before you go and uh, start varnishing or painting, you want to get your tack cloth and it feels like it's tacky. That's maybe why they call it that. But you very lightly rub that and all you're trying to do is pick up any loose dust. You should also notice that I changed into a bunny suit that's clean for the very simple reason that uh, I didn't want to be dropping dust off and I was too lazy to go back to the house and change clothes. So we've now removed the dust here. You'll also notice that I put paper down and this is clean. So the work surface is clean. The boat is now clean. We've got clean varnish. If there were any doubt, I could uh, run it through one of these uh, uh, filters, these conic filters that you also get at the paint store. Uh, this I think is pretty good. Now, one final thing is that, you know, when you're going to be sanding several layers uh, or putting several coats on, if you have a little bit of a problem on the first coat, uh, it's not a big deal. The first few coats are all going to get sanded. But as you get towards the end, two things. One is you're going to start getting a good feel for how to apply the varnish. Different varnishes apply differently. And the second thing is it's going to become more and more important to be very clean. So we're just about ready to start applying the varnish here. So having said about how bad it was to brush on like this, I'm going to more or less do that anyway and then I'll tell you why in just a second. So you probably can't see it. I doubt you can get the gloss in here but I'm putting enough on to where I can see a nice surface but it is not a particularly thick coat. And probably what's going to happen is all of this is going to get soaked up into this very soft cedar. Okay, and then I'm also going to just blot in some on the end grain here. And that's all going to soak in there. And in here, same thing. I'm going to be more blotting it than brushing it. Now, one of the things I very much appreciate about the epiphanes is that it tends to level beautifully. 
and given the right technique, this stuff will just about look like a sprayed on uh, finish, even though you've brushed it. Okay. Now, I went and did the back and forth application, but the only thing I was doing at this point was I was uh, putting on a, a more or less even coat because the coat that does the real work is actually going to be very, very lightly applied in one direction only. <clears throat> now this is always true. In the future when you do other varnish projects, uh, what I typically do is a real quick brushing on like this and then you want to go from dry into wet. You don't change the angle of the brush. So always dry into wet. You pull the surface flaws out and what you avoid is when you go back and forth you'll notice that at the front and the back of each stroke you change the direction, you change the angle of the bristles everything is wrong, there's no consistency so what we're doing is going dry into wet and we're just dragging that down very lightly and absolutely you do not want to squish the bristles down the bristles should be very, very lightly touched. <clears throat> you should barely have any bending at all on the bristles. And the brush should be at about a 45 degree angle. And we're just going to work all of those brush lines out. Now, when I go into the wet, I also, when I stop it, I very gently lift so I have no hard demarcation from my previous stroke. If you're not careful, you'll leave a brush stroke at the end. So you always want to get a very light feathering stroke in and work from dry into wet. And that's pretty much it. You let the bristles do the work, good quality brush, good quality varnish, and if you do this, you're going to get a good shine. This is going to be a nice finish, okay? So we're going to let this harden now, and when we come back, we're going to sand this, all right? We're well on our way to having a nice, shiny boat. Okay, all you yachtsmen out there, we've gotten our first coat brushed on. And uh, I don't know if you can see all this, but the first coat came out very nicely. Uh, you can see it's starting to get a shine. We've got more shine off the dense, darker grain. But as a first coat, it looks good. We don't have any runs or sags. Uh, the sides here, uh, because of the very open nature of the wood, needs a lot more work. So I'm going to give it a very quick sand with 180 grit. We're just going to take the top off. Anything that's sticking up here we're going to take down and it's going to be a very quick sand because we're not trying to go into the wood and then we're going to get ready for our next coat, okay? So I'm going to hit it. That was it. That was all it took. And when I say quick sand, I do mean a very quick sand. All we're trying to do is take off anything that's sticking up off the surface. We're ready to clean this up and I'm going to brush on another coat. All right? Hey folks, you feeling the love? Okay, we're having a great time and the T37s are all about having fun. I keep emphasizing that. And I want to make sure that you're enjoying every step in the process because it is a lot of fun. So I've sanded this with the 180 grit. And as you can probably see when this uh, it gets angled the right way, I've kind of got a little bit of a shine. I've got some of it that's dull. But basically it's an extremely light coat. So we're going to get ready to do the second coat now. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out is... When I was sanding here earlier, I had this covered with a piece of paper. I've removed that, so this is a pretty clean cover right now that I've got on this craft paper. 
I've also pre-thinned and pre-filtered my varnish. The Epiphanes recommends the second coat be thinned 25%. If you'll remember, the first coat was 50%. So it doesn't take very much. But this is the proper way to do it. I've separated out my varnish into a separate cup so that I am not going to contaminate my uh, good container of varnish with stuff that's going to be picked up off the deck. So let's do two things. First off, I'm going to get this brush into a little bit of the solvent, uh, the mineral spirits. I want to soften it up. So all you have to do is just barely dampen the fibers. Okay, so I'm going to get this soaking in here. You do not want to leave your brushes sitting in here. It will splay out the bristles and it will mess it up. I might also mention that just before you do your final coat, you might want to get the uh, uh, brush conditioner uh, solvent and clean your brush ahead of time. And this is so that you'll get rid of all of the dust that's in the bristles and you'll have a nice smooth finish and very soft bristles when you're brushing. Now you do want to be careful because paper towels shred easily. So I'm just giving it a very soft wipe and I'm going to let that start evaporating. Now remember I have put the brush back into the shaper or into this uh, thing to keep the bristles in good condition and keep the brush uh, uh, keep the bristles off the brush well shaped. Very important. So for the last thing, I'm going to take my tack rag and give that a very light wipe. So I'm going to do this very quickly. Remember, we don't need a lot of precision on this first application. We're just trying to get a more or less even coat. And we will come back momentarily and smooth it out with even strokes going in one direction only and not pressing hard on the bristles. So at this point, I have the deck entirely coated, and I'm going to go around and I'm going to do a blot, just daubing it on in the corners. All right, I think we're good. So now, I'm barely letting the weight of the bristles press down on this. You do have to be careful around the hatch opening that you don't squeegee off a big wet gob that's going to run on it. Now I'm going to daub here on the transom. It's a little bit tricky varnishing the sides here. But There we go. We're only putting enough to where we just get it damp. All right. <clears throat> if we go too much more, it's going to sag. So that's looking very nice. Now, if you'll notice, I'm barely applying any pressure. I'm barely displacing the bristles and that's how you want to do it. Very low pressure. You want to make the bristles do the work, not you. If you have a hard time getting your varnish to wet out and you're using pressure instead of the proper thinning technique, I suggest you check your thinning technique. One last flow. There we are. So here you can see that 
Got a pretty even coat. I have no brush strokes on it. I see nothing on the sides about runs. So we look good. Well, I'm probably not going to be showing you every coat after this because we're going to be applying quite a few coats. But anyway, we'll check in from time to time. Good varnishing. Okay, all you rabid T-37 sailors at... Oh, make that avid. Yeah, that's it. Avid T-37 sailors out there. Well, we're closing in on finishing the deck. And so this is coat number eight. And I think it's going to be the last coat. Well, first off, how do I know it's the last coat? A couple of reasons. One is... I have not sanded through the wood surface. All I'm seeing here is varnish, no bare wood. Second thing is, this is all completely evenly dull. Now there's a little dot right there and I'm going to leave that and that's because this is a demo boat. But I got eight coats of varnish on this. I now have no bare wood exposed and I have no glossy spots here so that I know that the wood grain has disappeared. Now, I've been sanding it for about the last four, maybe five coats with 320 grit sandpaper. So this is a nice, very fine finish. Now, I've also sanded around the border. And this is ready to go. I'm thinking that unless I screw up, this should flow out beautifully, and I will have a very, very even, smooth surface when I'm done. So, having said that, Let's go ahead and tack it. This is my tack cloth. Now remember, we just lightly rub the surface. All we're trying to do is get any loose dust that's hanging around on here. Now I'd already wiped it with mineral spirits before and let that dry. But just in case there was any paper towel uh, dust on there, any little filaments, we wanted to get that off. Okay, so we've tacked that down. Now, what other preparations did I do? First off, if you notice what I did with the tabletop, this is new, clean craft paper. So this has no dust on it. I didn't do any sanding on this. This is clean. I've put a new suit on. This has no dust on it. I've got new gloves. I took my brush. Now I've been keeping it inside its little holder. And I rinsed it out three more times just to make sure that I tried to get all the dust that might be in the bristles cleaned off of there. I also filtered the, the uh, varnish here with a coffee filter. And that's a much finer filter than like a paint filter. And it takes a while, but I'm pretty sure this is very, very clean at this point. So, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start brushing this. And as before, going back and forth isn't a big deal as long as the last coat or the last strokes are done in one direction. Also, as before, always be cautious around the hatch openings because it's very prone to getting wiped down and getting a run. It's also a little harder to start the brushing on that in that you have to start it without leaving a big ridge or leaving a holiday. Now, if you will remember your Varnishing 101, a holiday is a dry spot, the spot that you don't get. Okay. So here we go. We've got all of that done, keeping it very light. That's looking pretty good. And I think I squeegeed off kind of a thick piece on the transom, which means I'm going to have to squeegee that off, wipe it off very carefully when I come around to brushing it. So the whole deck is pretty evenly coated. And the last brushing I am doing I'm not even using the weight of any hand pressure. All I'm doing is using just the bare weight of the brush itself. 
and in general I try not to lean over the work and again it's just in case I have any dust on me it's to keep it from falling into the work itself so I'm going to keep going around here and even this big uneven side where I've cut the grain at a very slight angle which was very prominent has now pretty well disappeared just from sanding and varnishing so even the sides are looking very good and this cedar by the way is a lot harder to do than the T37 deck because the T37 deck has a kumi plywood which is an African mahogany and the African mahogany grain is much finer than this cedar. But that goes to show you that you can make a beautiful finish if you're determined pretty well regardless of what wood it is that you have. So one last extremely light wipe. Check it in the light. And I think that looks good. So, I think the next time we talk, we're probably going to be getting on to uh, doing the, the uh, primer. Pretty exciting. Talk to you later. Hey, all you T37 Yachts folks out there. We're uh, sitting here nice and warm inside while it's raining and pouring outside. You may be able to hear the rain on the roof. But I thought I would show you the results of brushing the last coat of varnish. So this is coat number eight, and if you'll remember, we sanded all the coats in between, and uh, the last five coats were sanded with 320 grit uh, using a block, and uh, the last coat we did very carefully with uh, very clean work area, clean brushes, and the results speak for themselves. I think this came out just about as nice as you could get. In fact, I think it stacks up pretty well against the sprayed varnish of the T37 that I've been doing in parallel with this. Anyway, the only thing is standing between you and a really beautiful finish is a little bit of sandpaper, a little bit of varnish, and a lot of patience. Okay, all you folks, you should be getting pretty used to the idea that you're going to be doing some finishing now, and before too long, you're going to go and have a boat to go out and sail. Anyway, I wanted to discuss very quickly what is the spray equipment that you might need. I've used a lot of spray equipment, <clears throat> and for something this size, I find the touch-up gun to be ideal. This is a, a touch-up gun that uh, I used to get from a paint distributor. Now I get it from Harbor Freight. It turns out that they're the same thing. Uh, they're pretty inexpensive. I've seen them on sale at Harbor Freight for $10. Normally they're $15, so it's not a big deal. This is a bottom feed cup. They also come in top feed uh, cups, and you can see that I've also used this one. I, I like them both. Uh, uh, equally sometimes the bottom feeds a little better but uh, this is a top feed the only advantage to this I find is that it'll use every last drop of paint uh, because it's gonna go all the way down to empty whereas that's a siphon anyway they're both very good guns uh, you can also probably pick it up at some of your auto parts stores that sell uh, car paints now you are going to need a compressor uh, this is uh, off to my compressor that's out of the camera range but I've got about 45 pounds of line pressure in this and before it gets here I've also got a water trap so it pulls water out of the paint uh, or out of the air before it gets to the paint supply very important for safety this is my trusty 3M uh, uh, respirator what you want is an organic vapor respirator. So you're going to want to get the cartridges that pick up organic vapors, you know, such as acetone and paint thinners. You want to make sure that it fits you well. They're not particularly cheap, but last time I checked, losing a lung is also not particularly cheap. And you're going to need 
a bunch of these. You can get these at the hardware store for just a few pennies a piece. So get a stack of them. You can also get cheesecloth and do several layers of that. But uh, anyway, for most of you, these uh, little paper filters, the conic filters, are just fine. You do not want to go straight from the can saying, well, it's a new can. If you get a particle trapped in here, you do not want to have to disassemble your spray gun in the middle of your spraying because you've now got a chunk of paint or varnish caught in the nozzle. That's a downside. All right. So one of the other things that I showed here is, uh, you know, maybe a little bit uh, odd, but I'm showing the thinner. Now the Epiphanes does not have a spray thinner, but if you use something that does uh, and it recommends a spray thinner, go ahead and get that. I find that the Epiphanes brush thinner works fine, but you're probably going to be thinning it a bit more than you're used to. So what I've got here. This is some pre-thin varnish, and roughly speaking, it's about the consistency of whipped cream as it comes out of the uh, comes out of the uh, little container. So, whipping cream consistency, you can see it pours, but if it gets too thick, you may be thinking you're saving uh, on uh, time because you can apply a lot thicker coat. The exact opposite is true. If it's that thick, it may not come out evenly and not flow well, and it may not come out very quickly at all. So you need it thin enough to where it comes out of the gun pretty quickly and easily. Now these are the 8 ounce uh, hot cups that I get from Costco, and you get a big sleeve of them. You don't want the wax paper cups because you don't want wax getting into your solvents. But get a sleeve of them. Like I said, I think this is eight ounces. Uh, the hot container cup for hot liquids works great. There's no wax on it. And uh, this way you can always work with clean, uh, fresh cups. That's pretty much it. All right. So next time we get together, we're going to be getting ready to spray this deck. Okay, guys. It's time to do it. So first off, I thought I would explain how it is that we adjust our paint sprayer. So I've got my uh, air line supplied at about 45 PSI. Now this is the trigger for uh, spraying. This is the volume control. So this con controls the amount of paint coming through there. You screw it in to reduce the amount of paint coming out. This is the pattern adjustment. If you screw it in all the way, the air that comes out of the side is shut off so it comes out in a round stream. If you back this up, if you go counterclockwise and open it up, it goes into a flat pattern. So I've spared no expense and covered my stand with uh, some craft paper so you can see what the adjustments are. Okay, so first I'm going to adjust the pattern. It's screwed all the way in now. And you see that's a nice round pattern. Now I'm going to open this up a bit. Now you see how it's flat? Flat is what we generally want. So we're going to be working back and forth. So we're going to leave this open. Now how much do we want? Generally speaking, the more you screw this in, the less paint that comes out. But what does come out is going to be more atomized. So if you open it up too much, you'll come out with coarse particles that are not going to flow very well. So I'm going to screw this all the way in to where we don't get anything. Well, that's still coming out a little bit. Barely coming out. Okay, that's, that's a very small amount of varnish. So I'm going to open it up a little bit more there. That looks pretty good. So I'm fairly happy with that. And uh, I think we're all set to go. Now, I masked off the sides. And the reason for that is that we're going to take the paint over the edge. I want to uh, cover up this exposed edge and make this uh, paint. One is because it's got a mix of uh, raw plywood on the edge showing. And also, I've filled it with some putty. 
So I want to hide those imperfections. Second reason, and this is pretty important actually, if you're racing much, there's a pretty good chance at some point someone may hit you on the corner. If you've got varnish all the way to the edge, you're not going to be able to repair the varnish. If you've got paint, however, you can repair the paint and no, no one will be the wiser. So generally speaking, I come into the edge like 3 16ths of an inch, just enough to cover over this. So uh, I will just cover over the plywood. All right. So now I want to uh, clean this and let's see, get my tack rag. So the tack rag is just picking up any loose particles. I've also put a paper towel inside the boat uh, over the rudder post and over the center just to keep the stuff from uh, the varnish from getting around down below too excessively. One of the things you're going to need to be careful of, particularly on the last coat, when you sand you're going to get dust down below. As the air blows through there you're going to go and stir up a lot of dust. So when you're getting to the last coats you want to vacuum out the inside and get all that dust out and put a new paper towel in. Alright, so let's get to varnishing. So you go to the end, stop, and then start again. Go back that way. Off, on. I might mention I also have a toothpick in the sails in the sheet uh, eyelet. Now this was a little bit too slow coming out, so I've increased the volume. You want to make sure to seal the ends because we've got exposed wood grain in here and exposed wood grain there. That's certainly good enough to seal it. And um, it looks even. I see no holidays on it. So we've got our first coat on. Didn't take very long, did it? Didn't hurt too much. All right, we'll see you in a few. Okay, guys, before we put uh, everything away, I thought I would cover very briefly how to clean up the sprayer. Now, if you do not adequately clean this up, you are really going backwards. So, you really do need to spend some time making sure this is absolutely clean. Now, we're not getting it particularly dirty, so it shouldn't take too long. But basically, you're going to go over the outside and the inside. So you want to get all of the res <coughs> residue off of the outside, particularly around the nozzle. Get all of it off here. Now, you then want to put a little bit of solvent in there. All right. That's clean solvent. So get that on. And normally I would do this outside, just so you know. And the reason I'm not wearing a mask is because, hey, I love you guys and I'm going to take a hit for the health just so you can understand me. Now we're going to spray inside of here. Like I said, normally I would spray outdoors. But you want to keep doing the wiping of the outside and the cleaning of the inside until you don't get anything in your rag. You use a fair amount of paper towels in this process. And one of the last things I do, now I've already uh, gone and done three clean and wipes to where I've wiped out the inside, sprayed, dumped it, and uh, so I've gone back and forth three times now. But generally what I'll do a couple of times is I'll take a paper towel, I'll put it against here. Now this will force air and paint back into the pot. If you've got dirty air lines and paint lines, your solvent will be dirty. That's a good indicator that you're not clean yet. So, you can feel the bubbles going through there. Now, if my solvent is clean, yes, my solvent is clean. So, with a clean solvent, I know that my gun is clean. 
but you're going to have to go through three or four iterations just to make sure that there is no paint, no varnish in there. Having said that, there's still a really good possibility, or actually uh, virtually a certainty, that at some point you're going to need to disassemble this, clean all the uh, parts to it, the needle, the tip, and that sort of thing. But at this stage, you definitely want to spend the time to do everything you can to keep it very clean. All right? See you in a bit. Hey, all you yachtsmen out there. Uh, we're moving along on our uh, varnishing. Now, I've got both the brushed on and the sprayed on versions here, so I thought I'd pass this along show you how we're doing. This is the third brush coat onto our uh, Cedar T37 deck model. And if you can see in the shine here, you'll see that there's actually a very high gloss to it, but you can see the texture of the wood grain. So this, if you were at this stage, would be well protected. You could stop here. Uh, the only downside is that you're seeing wood grain. So with three coats, we've got adequate protection for the deck. But if you want to make the grain disappear, we're going to keep on sanding. Now I'm going to show you the actual T37. Now this is the second coat of spray. And it has, a, the, the Akumi plywood has a little different look and a different texture than the cedar. It's got a lot more small grains in it. And if you can look at this, uh, you probably can see in the light, but there's still streaks of low parts in the grain that have not been sanded. Now this is 180 grit sanded <clears throat> at this point, and you can see that there are still some lows. I have sanded through the wood in some areas, that's all okay. But at this point, you should be starting to see where the high parts are getting sanded off and the low parts are still glossy. We're going to keep sanding and spraying until the whole thing achieves a nice even gloss. All right. So the only thing that you need to do if you want a perfect finish is just more sanding and more coats. And at some point, all these lows will be filled with varnish. All right. Well, let's get back to it because there's some racing happening. We'll see ya. Okay guys, uh, I just sprayed the third coat. Now I just previously shown that I had sanded it with 180 grit. But I wanted to show you that even though this is sprayed, this is not a perfect coat yet. And the reason I wanted to point that out is there's lots of little pinholes. These are low spots. If you tried to fill all of these holes in one coat, you'd way overdo it and you'd be going backwards. So I wanted to show you that this is normal and that for a little while you'll still be seeing these pinholes. But this is a third coat. Uh, the grain is getting very close to being filled, but it's not there yet. So don't try. If you try and do it with a lot of uh, varnish, you're going to end up having it so thick that it'll never harden underneath. So just a word of precaution. We're moving right along. We'll talk to you later. Hey all you yachtsmen out there, we're working on our finish and because sanding is so important I thought I'd cover it for a few minutes, talk about it. Uh, I have talked about it in the past but it really is the key to a great finish and I'm not just talking about T37's here. If you've worked on other projects, um, maybe even if you've even sanded uh, a car before you've had it painted by your Uncle Fred, the techniques that you use can be carried across anything. So I thought I'd spend just a couple of minutes and start out by showing you another project I'm working on. Don't tell my wife. This is a present for her. And this is an art frame. And this is curly maple Peruvian walnut. There's no straight lines on that. Uh, this was cut out with a bandsaw, so there's all kinds of tooth marks all over it. The only way to get this right was to cut a sanding block that fit the shape of the inside and then go around this. Now, I went all the way around until all the teeth marks uh, were removed from the bandsaw. And in fact, the way I got these tight radii 
to be perfectly matched was I cut well, I cut both of these from the drawings that I did and put sandpaper on one and just sanded this back and forth to make the perfect radius. But all of this, including right up here, I used a sanding block just to get off all of the marks and to make this perfectly round. That's a very long way of saying sanding blocks are your friend and they are your key to making a perfect sanding uh, piece. To getting your finish all smooth, you have to use this. Now, the reason that we're using this is as I sanded across here, all of the highs were sanded down until this became one consistent circle. When you sand with a, a sanding block, or if you're sanding with an electric sander, you have to hold your block or your sander perfectly flat across the surface. Now, in this case, because there are no curve, or because there's no flat surfaces, I've glued together two sheets of sandpaper and I form a curve that contours to this. By gluing the two pieces together, this makes this a little stiffer and I'm able to evenly span slight lows. That's critical. Okay, also, this is a stand that I built using quarter inch wood dowels so that I can spray paint it. Okay, here's our T37. It now has five coats of varnish on it. This is the spray deck. And if you look at it, you'll see that there are highs that have been sanded off. There's a few glossy lows. Now, so many times in the past, I've seen people sanding and they say, oh, well, there's a shiny spot, it's a low. So I'm just going to sand that down, and they use a corner. That is exactly 100% wrong. Why is it shiny? Well, it's shiny because it's a low spot. If you try and sand this, you're going to create an even lower spot. So when this all becomes shiny, when you put your last layer, all of your low spots are going to jump out at you. So it is absolutely crucial that you hold your sand paper and sanding blocks absolutely flat. So rule number one, hold your sanding blocks, hold your uh, electric sanders flat, flat, flat. Rule number two, if you want to use a corner to take out a low, see rule number one. All right? One last thing, I'm wearing this Tyvek suit. It looks dirty. It's actually not. If you get a good quality Tyvek suit and you uh, take care of it, you can put it in the wash with a gentle cycle and it, it may last a dozen uh, washings. So anyway, that may be a time saver and a money saver for you. We'll see you later. Okay, all you yachts folks out there, we're closing in on this. So this is coat number eight and I want it to be the last one. First off, how do I know it's the last coat? Well, at this point, I have an evenly dull surface, but I have not sanded through the varnish. So I have no exposed raw wood, and I also have no shiny spots. Now, I do have a little bit of a shiny right along the edge, but that's going to be finished with uh, paint. I'm going to put some uh, sanding primer on that, so I'm not too worried about this. But the main part, the flat uh, part on the deck, is uniformly dull. I have no glossy areas, meaning I have no low areas, and I have no high areas, and I haven't gone through the wood. That tells me I'm pretty well ready to go. Well, what should we do on the preparations? I did several things. One is I turned the heat off. This is a heated shop, and that's to keep the dust from blowing around. Now, the other thing I did I pulled out, after sanding, I pulled out all the old rags that were in here, vacuumed out the inside, then took a piece of cardboard, spray glued the back, put a nail through it, cut the cardboard such that I could put it in diagonally, and then pulled it up against the back side. So this is now covered and isn't going to be blowing dust when I spray over it. I changed the paper on the table 
this is all now clean craft paper. Remember, we're really all about keeping the dust down. I've changed suits. I have a clean paper suit on with no dust on it, clean gloves. Um, uh, I've changed clothes. I also uh, double filtered the uh, varnish. I used a coffee filter this time, which is much finer than a regular paint filter. A little slow to drain, but I'm pretty sure I've got very clean varnish at this point. Everything is about cleanliness at this point, okay? I've tacked off the uh, box here, wiped it down with a little bit of solvent. This is my tack cloth. I'm going to do one last tack. You do not rub hard, remember. We're just trying to get any loose dust that might be on the surface off. So, they're very light wiping. Now this is not to say that if I screw up I might not have to go through this again because I might well go through it again if I'm not happy with the finish. But at this point I'm pretty certain that I've done all the research, I've gotten a good surface, I have clean surfaces. About the only thing that I haven't done that is not a bad idea is to take a garden hose and wet out the floor so that as you're walking you don't kick up a lot of dust, okay? So I'm going to spray this now. Remember about 45 pounds in the line. Check it. There we go. It's a little bit too round. There. Everything's clean. Clean gloves. Yeah, we're ready to go. Checking the gloss off of the reflections. Make sure I get a nice, evenly wet coat. Don't have any holidays. And so I'm going to let this be a little bit orange peely, knowing that with just a little bit of time, it's going to flow out beautifully. And that does look pretty nice. Not seeing whole bunches of chunks. There. And that's pretty much it. I think this is going to be very good. Uh, not to say that something can't happen uh, in the meantime, but for right now this is a good looking surface. I don't see lots of debris in it and it's already starting to flow out beautifully. So I think this uh, coat number eight is going to be the last one. We'll talk to you later. Hey all you almost T37 boat builders out there. It's a dark and stormy night here in beautiful Port Hadlock and uh, we're battening down the hatches and manning the pumps. But uh, I thought I would show you the results of the uh, last layer that we did. This is layer number eight. I sprayed it yesterday and as you can see the results are pretty good. I'm seeing a little more dust in there than I would like and probably it would have helped if I would have wet down the floor. But all things considered, that's a pretty nice finish. So the only thing that's standing between you and a beautiful finish like this is some sandpaper, some varnish, and most importantly, patience. So let's get busy on that, boat builders. We want to see you out there racing. Hey, Mr. Pitt. Uh, can I call you Brad? Look, no, I'm not going to do the next movie. Look. Even if I get top billing over Angelina, no. I'm busy with the T-37s right now. So, uh, we'll do lunch sometime. Love your latest. Bye. Okay, guys. This epic movie is moving right along. And I thought I would uh, get started on how do we do the masking. And so at this point, I've sanded the sides. And the varnished edge has disappeared. We've made the sides smooth. Same thing on the transom. So we've feathered in the varnished edge. That's all disappeared. We're ready to do the masking. So what do we want to do for the masking? Well, you want to use the right masking tape. So what do you mean by that? Well, by that, I mean this is Scotch 2080 uh, masking tape. It's a very, very fine line tape. 
sometimes it's called uh, masking for delicate surfaces. You can get this at the hardware store, but you'll notice right away it's much, much thinner, much finer, much less texture than the standard tape. Now here's a tape that I use quite a bit. It's a 233 plus. Wonderful stuff, would not use it. Very simple reason. This has a lot of creping, that is a lot of wrinkling so this can bend. That allows paint to leak under it, so we do not want that. So again, 2080, you'll see a blue on an orange backing. Now in addition, we want to have uh, some fine line tape that will go around curves. So this is some eighth inch that I've got. And this is the 3M 471 Plus. This happens to be eighth inch. It's a very good width for water lines. Very nice at this scale. Here's another one you might consider. This is the 218 fine line. This happens to be 1 16th inch thick. Also a very nice width for doing uh, like water line stripes, that sort of thing. The difference is the 218 is a mylar tape. It does beautiful fine lines, but it tends to be a little bit stiff. This, the 471 Plus, is a vinyl tape. It tends to allow for more radius uh, and more movement. Uh, I kind of prefer this. Anyway, both of these are available at car parts stores. The 2080 is available at the hardware store. So let's get started. <clears throat> You'll probably remember this. This is my combination square. I've set this to where it's oh, kind of a fat 3 sixteenths of an inch. How did I come up with that? Well, this is the edge of the plywood for the hull. I want to go just beyond that. So it doesn't have to be anything in particular, but we're just going to go around here. I'm going to use this pen. We're going completely around the edge. Okay, so I've gotten a 3 16 inch line there. I'm going to go and angle this slightly. I could change my adjustment for the transom. It doesn't matter too much. Whatever aesthetically uh, floats your boat. There, now that edge is done. Now let me show you a little trick that I've got. This is a flat washer for a quarter inch bolt. And the uh, ID of this is just slightly over a quarter inch. That happens to be a pretty handy size. And I think aesthetically about right. So I'm going to put it in here do a quick little radius there. <clears throat> do a radius here. And draw a radius here. And am I done? No, I'm not. What I'm going to do now is take a little corner of this and I'm going to place it over the radius and you need to go just a little past the radius that you've drawn. Okay, so that's done. Now I'm going to finish drawing this line. I thought I'd take just a little break uh, to describe and show in a little more detail than I could get from that distance what it is exactly that I'm doing. First off, one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that we want this to be clean. If you have dirt along the shear, when you mask it, paint can leak under there. 
So let's give it a quick little wipe. And this is the tack cloth, remember. So we want to get the dust off of the surface just to make sure that we do not have a path for paint to leak under. All right. And another thing I wanted to show, because this is so shiny, you're really going to have a problem marking this with a pencil and having it show. So I'm using a Sharpie Ultra Fine Line Point. And for that, let me show you real quickly. You can see that this is an extremely fine point. Now it's somewhat permanent, but this should wipe off with our uh, mineral spirits pretty easily once we're done. Okay, so where are we with this? Why did I do this? Now, if you take a look, you'll notice I drew this little circle using my quarter inch flat washer. Now here what I'm doing is covering the radius with this little one inch long piece. And we're going to do that at each corner, right like that. So it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, but you do need to cover the corners. All right, now we're going to get the nose. So again, you can see this radius here, and I'm just going to cover it, make sure it's completely covered. Now, when I mask, I like to get it eye level for a very simple reason. When you sight down this way, you can get a very good idea of how smooth and how fair your curve is. So I'm going to go with the eighth inch fine line and I'm going to start by defining the shear and masking with the eighth inch. When I'm done with that, we're going to take uh, an X-Acto knife and we're going to take our quarter inch uh, t circle template, that is our quarter inch flat washer, and we're going to redraw this based upon our actual lines. So let's get started. Now one of the first things is, you do not want to pull this too tight. The technique I use is I unroll with these two fingers and I guide it with my thumb. So I'm siding along here and you want to be careful not to bend the tape because you can put a permanent kink in it and if you do get a kink then you might as well start over but I'm looking at this shear it's going along beautifully and if I were to look overhead I'd say gee that looks pretty easy uh, that looks pretty good but it's easy to miss an unfairness an unfairness being something other than a totally smooth curve and remember, your eye can pick up an unfairness more quickly than it can pick up a difference in the thickness. So in other words, if you make an abrupt turn, but you average a pretty good eighth inch, that will show up as an error if you have to make any quick turns. Whereas a gradual, smooth curve will not show as a flaw nearly as easily. So your eyes pick up corners, so you want to be very careful. There. And that looks pretty good. I'm going to keep on drawing and we'll be back to you in just a minute. Okay folks, I thought I'd show you what I've done. And I'm going to show this at a low angle and the reason for that is just like your eye you can look at the edge and see that it's a smooth curve. And if you look at it overhead, you'd miss some things. Now, for instance, when this was being drawn, I can see where I bumped or somehow moved my uh, combination square, and the line is not absolutely smooth. But by holding my eye at a very low angle and looking at it while I was laying the tape on, I kind of spanned those little bumps and made a very smooth curve. So this, uh, this edge is very smooth and that edge is very smooth. Same thing back here. You can see that that's a very smooth curve 
you probably can't see the line that I've got, but it's a little bumpy. Doesn't matter. I was able to pick that up. Now you can also see that I've radiused the two corners here, and I'm going to be radiusing this bow, and I'm going to show you how I did it. So we come up here, and I follow these lines until these two edges are both tangent. Now you might want to put a little bit of maybe, I don't know, spray glue or double-sided tape here because you've got to come and very carefully trim this radius without moving the washer. And right now you might be saying, oh, but Danny, you're cutting through my nice shiny varnish. Yes, that's true. But when we redo this, when we shoot it with primer, the primer is going to go into those little cuts that we had and fill it up. Okay, so these edges are all done and I'm happy with the smooth curve. I'm going to go back and re-explain one thing too, and that is how I lay the tape on. Again, I put my fingers inside and I'll lay this down and I side along this and I drive it with my thumb. I told you that earlier but I want to make sure that you knew what I meant. I mean I'm altering the radius slightly by using a little bending and using my thumb to tighten that up. So I can actually encourage it to make a bend. Anyway, so that's how I do it. That's a real technique. It works on 37 inch boats, it works on 37 foot boats. So now, we've got our radius done uh, on the three corners, and I'm gonna show you another technique. Now, here's what would happen if we did nothing. If we were to start spraying paint here, you can see that the edges are not quite flat. Where you've got tape overlaps, you have a minuscule but decidedly uh, imperfect uh, gap there that will allow paint to go in there. So you're saying, oh Danny, but how will I prevent paint from going over there? Relax. Remember, T37s are about relaxing. So here, I've got a little varnish. And what I'm going to do is, first off, I'm going to push the corners down. I push the overlap to where it's as thin as it's going to be and then I take a sharpened stick and I put it right against there. And you're saying, Danny, why are you doing that? We we're done with varnish. Well, what we're doing is we're allowing the varnish to leak under the gap instead of uh, primer paint or red white or blue or whatever the paint color you're going to have. We're going to let clear varnish leak under there so that when you see that there might be a tiny bit of varnish but you're never really going to see that but the varnish will leak under that gap in the tape or that overlap not a contrasting color so when we get all these corners all these overlaps touched with this varnish we will have only varnish leaking under the corners. You understand? So, at this point, I'm just going to blot the excess. Now we should have a nice little bead of varnish that's leaked under the tape at the joint. That's fine. So now, all we have to do is take our 2080 tape and rather quickly, we're just going to go over that. So at this point, it's pretty straightforward. We just leave a little bit of our blue vinyl tape showing. And then we will use our wider tape to ensure that we have adequate, adequate coverage over the deck. All right? So we'll see you in a bit. Hey all you model yachters out there, we're getting ready to put some color on the boat. Before that, we're going to go and put some primer on. So I wanted to go over a couple things. One is, 
first off, the, the boat itself has now been taped. I've masked it with some, in the center, I put some 2 inch wide 2080 uh, 3M tape. And then I double taped over the border just because I was concerned that some of these wrinkles might be a path for paint to leak in. So I want to make sure that doesn't happen. So I've gone and thoroughly taped here, and I've thoroughly taped with like three layers around the mask because here we've got a lot of paths to where paint could leak under. Definitely don't want that to happen. Now, I've torn off a small piece of Scotch-Brite, and what you want to do at this point is go around the edge, and you want to scuff up that varnish. You want to make sure that that's clean and ready for an epoxy primer to bond to. You could use some 400 grit sandpaper, but you do not want to use anything rough because you'll tear this very, very thin paint, or uh, excuse me, masking tape. So we just go around here, and we're gonna prep all of this, and we're gonna make very, very sure that we do not grab this radius. This is very susceptible to being torn off. So you want to be extremely careful not to get that torn up. All right? So you might well ask, after we mask that, why did I cut this out? Well, we're faced with a dilemma. When we paint, we really need access to both the top and the underside simultaneously. Because I had built a number of T-37s, I decided to build this tool. And we've also had a lot of uh, building sessions, so we've got a lot of people that come in and out of here. So I took some scraps of quarter-inch plywood, and I cut one the exact cutout size of the hatch, and then one uh, about a quarter-inch larger all the way around. Maybe you can see that. And then I put this piece of two feet of quarter-inch all-thread that's just threaded rod. That's available at the hardware store. I ran it through, and what we do then, we stick this in place. Now, with that there, I can put this and clamp it onto a two by four, hang it from the ceiling, whatever, but I've got access all the way around. Maybe you think that's too much work for just one boat, and that's fine. There are ways around that. So we take the world's second most expensive building cradle, the first one being the garbage can, up in that, and this is just a piece of 4x4, four four, and we can put it right over here. Now that will work fine, but one extreme caution. This is very unstable. It could easily tip. If you're going to do this, you might want to cut a little wider piece or, or just make this more stable. Work at keeping this stable. You do not want this to fall off of your stand at this point. So here we've got access to the underside. We can take a sprayer, we can spray under here, or if we're brushing it, we could do it that way. But we've got complete 360 degree access this way. Okay? So if your boat is really done, that is all the pinholes are filled, um, you could stop at 120. It would probably be better to sand to 180 grit. But anyway, at that rate, you are really ready to sand. The one thing that I want to caution you about, you may think this is perfect, but I guarantee you that when you spray that coat of primer on there, things that you never saw coming are going to pop out at you. That's great. That's exactly what primer's for. It's going to take care of all these little surprises. It will probably take three coats if you're using the epoxy, and it may take twice or three times as much if you're getting the rattle can sanding primer. But this rattle can or the uh, spray primer, the epoxy spray primer, however you do it, the whole point of that is it builds very quickly, and we're going to make this surface perfect. It's going to look like plastic when we're ready to put color on it. Okay, well let's get moving then. Okay primates out there, we're getting ready to shoot primer. So I thought I would show you a couple of things before I get started. One is there were a couple of little lows and pinholes in this rudder and I put epoxy putty in it and it's wet. 
But because I'm spraying epoxy primer over it, I'm going to go wet on wet. So I'm going to spray wet epoxy paint over epoxy putty, and I've never had any problems with this. I would not do that if I had the rattle can primer. So just so you know, I think that it should be just fine if you stick epoxy with epoxy. I'm going with the International 404-414 epoxy primer here. So I've gone with 100 grams of the base white, and I've gone with 22 grams of the hardener. And then I added about 30% by weight of the solvent. That's the 2316 in thinner. This has been filtered, so that's why I left this here. I really do filter it. So roughly speaking, we've got a hundred and a quarter grams of paint, and then the thinner is added on top of that. We're going to get this here. Now on the varnish. <clears throat> the varnish tended not to float, and it doesn't tend to be too bad. I don't seem to react to it. This is starting to get nasty, so I am going to use a respirator. You definitely want to do that, and when you start spraying the linear polyurethanes, it's even worse, so be sure to use your respirator. Now I don't know if you can see that, but that is a flattened spray pattern and I made it come out a little thinner because it was going too fast. Now that's just the first coat. I'm going to keep on doing this. It'll probably get another at least two coats on top of that. Okay, as you can see, I've got some painting to do here. I'm going to keep on applying coats. I don't know if you can see it, but that was a relatively light coat. I'm still not quite done on the far side. But I'm going to keep on going at this point, and like I said, I'm going to go ahead and spray on probably another two entire coats. Now what's happening is the solvent is evaporating from this, and this is turning to a putty. So if I were to just keep on shooting primer on here, now it would sag. But if I give it just a few minutes, the solvent will evaporate. It'll become thick enough to where I can apply a second coat. So I should be able to get, oh, two or three coats, maybe even four total. All right. Well, I'm going to close the, uh, the camera now because the lens is going to get coated with overspray if I don't. But uh, the fumes are not entirely pleasant, I can tell you that. So we'll talk to you later. Look, I am your father. Mm, to all he is, yes. Anyway, we've gotten our first coat of primer on there. If you were doing this along with yours, you may have been shocked to see how flawed it was. Well, that's exactly what the primer is supposed to do. So I can see 
that I'm going to have to do a little bit of puttying before I even go to the next coat of primer. So I've got a few little cracks and stuff where the joint between the bottom and the sides needs a little help. But all in all, it looks great. Um, when I sand this off, probably about three quarters of the primer is going to go away on this first coat. Um, but that's to be expected. The next coat is going to go on a lot smoother because I really have done a lot for filling in these parts. Anyway, this does look pretty good. So uh, if you look at the rudder, you can see that the little areas that I did the wet coat on, uh, those are showing up. That's fine. Uh, so when I sand this, I know I'm going to sand into the epoxy putty. Doesn't matter. That is all exactly what the primer is supposed to do. It's going to be about the third coat when we start seeing how, tr how good we were and how perfect we can make it. Okay? I'm going to get out of here because uh, the air has suddenly gotten a bit dense. Uh, not unlike myself. So we'll talk to you later. Hey all you racers out there. Just got through with a day of racing over in Port Ludlow. It's the middle of winter and we didn't even get our feet wet. Wonderful time to go sailing on the T-37s. So I wanted to show you what sanding on the first coat looks like. So I got the first coat sanded and I also applied some more putty to it uh, so that I could get some lows that I discovered while sanding. So here's the rudder and you can see that I've sanded through an awful lot of it. It's gotten very thin in a number of areas but I have a razor sharp trailing edge and a nicely rounded leading edge. So all of that looks really good. Uh, <clears throat> I think most of that is going to be covered up in the next coat of primer. This will signal the end of any sanding you can do on the fins with an electric sander because it's going to start getting too thin and too uh, delicate and too easy to go through. So now here I am on the hull and you'll notice that I've sanded through an awful lot of the primer right into the wood. In particular, you want to note that right here in the forefoot, that's the area between the knuckle of the bow and the leading edge of the keel, I did some filling, and that's because I discovered there was a little low spot. So that's all now filled and sanded. Don't be surprised if that happens to you. And here we can see the keel. And like I said with the rudder, I think at this point that's all going to have to be sanded by hand with a block. But the bulb will be sanded by spray gluing the sandpaper back to back. Now all of this has been 180 grit sandpaper, so it feels pretty smooth. And as we get closer and closer to perfection, we want to keep our getting our sanding grit finer and finer. But all through here you can see that there's been a little filling. A lot of the primers come off. But you can also see that it's starting to get a surface that where it's all white, it's very much looking like a smooth plastic surface. Okay, all you folks out there building the T-37s, we're here at the Galactic Center of T-37-ness. And uh, I just applied the second coat of epoxy primer onto this. Uh, looks pretty good. I can tell I still am going to need a third coat um, and I do hope that the third coat will be it because as all you math majors know four is not a prime number. Yuck yuck. I thought I'd spend a little time to tell you about guide coats. Now I'm going to use an acrylic enamel black. You can get these though as dedicated prime coats at the automotive store. When you get over there select a color that is uh, very contrasting to whatever your primer is, but uh, black is probably going to be a pretty good one. But uh, just a regular black will work. In this case I'm using uh, an acrylic enamel. You want to put this on really, really super thin. Now what is a guide coat? What it is is just a contrasting color that will lie in the lowest parts of the paint that when you sand it off, if you have anything that is not sanded, you'll see it as a contrasting color. So, watch this. It is just an extremely light mist 
And all we're going to do is have this little fine black mist to sand through. And when all of the black is gone, we will know that we have sanded all the way to the bottom. It's very easy to miss these, uh, these low spots when you have no contrast in color. So I'm going to finish this. And like I say, this is very speckledy. You do not want anything more than just the absolute minimum. You don't win bony, uh, bonus points for having too much of this. That's about it. I have a nice, even, well, reasonably even coat. I've got black speckles over everything. So when these black speckles disappear, that's it. This will help you keep from sanding through your other layers uh, when you start going on this because you'll know that once the black disappears, you can stop. All right, catch you later. Hey, all you boat build a fires out there, uh, getting ready to sand coat number two on the primer. So I thought I'd take a real quick look at what it is we want to see and what we don't want to see. Now I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. And I saw some areas that I wasn't real happy with. Um, it had a little bit of wood grain showing through, so I went ahead and puttied that. Uh, to prep it, I wiped off the black paint, the guide coat that is, with a little acetone just to make sure that it had good clean surface underneath it. But you can see a few little spots where I went and glazed with the epoxy putty have a little bit on the far side too but on the whole it's looking pretty good now what I do not want to do on this next coat is going to be to sand through deeply into the wood it may happen a little bit but we're really trying to avoid doing that what we want to do is start having a good solid base here now it, Typically it takes about three coats uh, to get enough paint built up to where we can really see the perfection in the finish. And when we put the gloss on there, it'll be a perfectly shiny, glossy surface. Okay, all you primordial painters out there, we're really closing in on it. This is the second layer of primer that's been sanded. And uh, I wanted to give you an idea of what it might look like when you get to this level. Now, it is not perfect. You can see that the wood is shown through in a couple of areas. It's not nearly as badly as it was after the first coat was sanded, but it's significant. Now, I think I'll be able to apply just a little bit more primer right to that area locally uh, when I'm doing all the rest of the boat, and it should be okay. But the other thing to notice is that all of our uh, guide coat, the black guide coat we painted, is pretty well gone. Now I'm going to zero in and I'll show you just a little tiny spot that's showing that it's got a little bit of a low there, right at the back of the keel. That is guide coat that is in a low, so it did not get sanded off. I'm actually going to take a little toothpick and some primer and just daub it on there. That should take care of that. And when I sand the next one and put the guide coat on that, it should all disappear in the third coat of sanding. Now, what I also did is on the bulb, I sanded it with 220 grit by hand. It's too round to use any blocks. And now I did glue the 220 back to back. The rest of the boat I used 180 grit, but just on the bulb because you're concentrating all of your sanding in a very small area, the 220 grit keeps you from sanding too quickly. Finally, here's the rudder, and the rudder actually looks great. If I were to put a gloss on that now, it would probably look really good, but I'm going to give it just a light coat of primer so that I can get a truly perfect surface. But you can see that there's just the barest hint at the very tip that it might have gone through into the fiberglass. So we might as well aim for perfection at this point, but it's looking great. We'll see you later. Hey guys, just posing a question, but if a paint job turned bad, would that be primeval? Yeah, I'm not sure. Anyway, here we are. This is the third coat. And 
I've sanded most of it, but I thought, you know, maybe it would be informative to not completely sand it to show you where perfection meets near perfection. So right here up in the bow, I don't know if this is going to show very well, but there's a little tiny bit of the guide coat still showing there. Um, so that's telling me I have the tiniest bit to sand there. Now because that's a point, I need to be extremely careful and while I had been using the electric sander with 320 grit, that would go through too quickly. So I'm going to finish that with a hand sanding block. Right here is some more area that is just barely the most uh, faint ghosting of the guide coat. That needs a little tiny bit more. Now I sanded this area with a sanding block as much as I could. And same thing on the trailing edge. But there is a limited amount that you can do. Now this is the sanding block that I've got. It's a piece of flat plywood with 320 grit. So I sanded here as much as I could and then touched it up with my hand sanding block. Sanding, uh, basically sort of reaching around like this and sanding uh, along with the length of the cord. And then sanded the trailing edge with the block as much as I could because you do not want to lose definition. And then here you can see that I'm actually just getting thin, but I'm not all the way through the primer, so that's still okay. But looking at the rest of it, it's all evenly matte finished and there is not a flaw in it. There is not one bit of grain showing, so I'm thinking this is going to be the last coat there. Now, in addition, I wanted to show what the rudder looks like, also partially sanded. Uh, I've sanded with a block pretty much as much as I can, and then I'm going to have to finish the tip. And you can see how nicely that guide coat shows you where you need to work. So this is uh, almost perfection. I stopped a little bit short, and I also dress this trailing edge by putting the sanding block square to it and giving just a few very, very light sanding drags to give it a nice, hard, breakaway surface for the water. So anyway, this is coming along well. Uh, the surface is almost done and it's virtually perfect. So this is looking like it's going to be a real good job. All right, we'll see you later. Hey, all you T37oids out there. We're closing in on getting a layer of gloss paint on this hull. So I thought I'd give you one last look at it and tell you how it's been prepped for uh, its gloss coat. All right, here is the last coat of primer. It was, uh, the final sanding was done by hand with 320 grit. I used a flat, flat block to sand all of the flat areas. Then I spray glued uh, back to back the 320 grit to sand the radius on the chine and also on the leading edge of the keel. But if you take a look here, you'll see that it's virtually all matte finished white primer. There are no divots in it. There's no wood grain in it. There's no dust sticking up off of it. It basically is perfectly smooth. And uh, the little spot priming I had to do on the bow has been blended in. So we're looking really good. All right, so what other preparations have I done? Once this was completed, I wiped it down with uh, two wipes, clean paper towels in between each wipe with acetone. So the hull, deck, everything was wiped down with acetone once. And then I used this slow degreaser. Now you probably don't really need it, but it's not a bad idea. The degreaser is just another step to getting everything clean. I put a new piece of craft paper on top of the uh, tabletop. The stands, which are 4x4s, I washed down and uh, scrubbed a little bit to get the dust off of. The floor, if you look, has been wet down, so I've got water that I put on the floor and then swept around to keep the dust down. I put a new clean paper suit on and uh, new clean gloves and I'm thinking only clean thoughts. So anyway, 
the point here is that everything you want to be really, really clean, even to the extent of wiping down the air hose for the sprayer so that you don't end up dragging uh, dust particles around. Uh, finally, I turned off the heater. This is a heated shop because I didn't want the heater coming on and blowing around a lot of dust. So that's it. Think about how you can keep your shop clean and your work area clean when you spray it and you'll be a lot happier. So just before I put the gloss on, I've got one wipe to do with the tack cloth and we're done. All right. Okay, all you T37 fanatics out there, we're getting ready to put some shiny on the boat. So let's review very quickly what's going on. So immediately before spraying, I'm going to very lightly wipe this down with a tack cloth. My floor is still wet. I've got clean everything. So we want to make sure that all of the dust is picked up on this tack cloth. You do not rub hard. You very lightly wipe. And you do it immediately before you put the gloss on because dust is always in the air. So that's done. I have mixed my paint exactly as per the instructions. Um, some people think, oh, the paint companies don't know what they're talking about. Believe me, they want you to put a shiny, beautiful surface on there. So I'm going to have to put this on now. Uh, very important, particularly with the linear polyurethane, some real nasty paint. But it does do beautiful work. So I'm going to put this on. I'm going to spray the pattern on here, and you're going to see what the spray pattern is. I'm going to make it very slightly flattened with a vertical flattened pattern and it's going to be a light mist. My colors are going to be white bottom and uh, I think I'm going to go with the blue gray top side. So right now I'm going to spray gloss white pretty much all the way to the sheer. So transom I'm not going to worry about uh, much uh, above the top half inch or so I'm not going to worry about either. Okay, Time to put the mask on. I'll show you what's going on and we'll get some shiny on here. Okay. That's too much paint. That looks pretty good. Maybe, yeah, maybe reduce that even a little more uh, with a little less paint. Okay, I'm not going to keep my mask off for long, but that was a very light mist coat. I can still see a little bit of the uh, hull through there, so it's not a thick coat. Do not put a thick coat on there. We want it to be thin, and excuse me, I'm going to breathe for a bit. This is more like a mist coat. 
So we're putting the first coat on pretty light. In about 20 minutes, I'm going to come back and put on another thicker coat, okay? We'll talk to you later, and I'm going to go outside and get some O2. Hey, builders out there. Just thought I'd give you a real quick look at uh, the way the boat looks now that I've sprayed this. Uh, came out pretty well. There's some dust that landed on it, but all things considered, it looks pretty shiny. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start masking this off. I'm going to make the top sides a blue-gray. But uh, anyway, that's what she looks like on the shiny bottom side. We're going to make her another color here in just a little bit. Talk to you later.
Okay guys, we're uh, getting ready to spray paint the top side, so I'm going to show you how I do it. I've built a template here. I use drafting mylar available at uh, drafting supply stores, but thick craft paper should work just fine. The basic idea is I lightly, lightly spray glue the back side of my template, make it about 4 inches wide, about 38, 39 inches long, with that light tack coat of adhesive, you put it on the bottom, you trace the perimeter, and then pull it off, then cut along the perimeter. Then in a second I'll show you when I pull it off, but you draw a straight line from the corner of the transom to the bow. This magenta line is actually a straight line. So I went and using this Sharpie Ultra Fine Point, which is like uh, 0.05 uh, millimeters, you just lightly go with some ticks about every inch or so. So I will remove that template now. And you'll see that I have marked this with a series of black spots. And that's my reference. So this is a slightly banana shaped template. And you can see that starting from the point of the bow, I come aft 6 inches and come down 1.83. The next one is 9 inches down 1.63. 12 inches down 1.48. 15 inches down 1.395. 18 inches 1.315 down. 24 inches, excuse me, 21 inches back, 1.285 inches down. 24 inches, 1.28 inches down. 27 inches, go down 1.325. At 30 inches, go down 1.35. 33 inches, go down 1.43. And then the next one is a couple inches back, and that's about where it uh, is even with the rudder post. This also begins four and three quarter inches back from the point of the bow, okay? Those dimensions were all from this magenta straight line. So, here's our masking tape. I'm using the eighth inch 3M vinyl tape. The part number is 06404. Uh, the type of tape is 471 plus, available at uh, auto stores. Uh, I've also got some 3M fine line tape, and this is uh, mylar tape. Not as flexible, but uh, very precise, and that is 218 style. All right, so now we're going to get to actually masking. So where I'm handling it and touching it, I'm going to have that hang off the end. So I very carefully pull this off. The vinyl is very soft and very stretchy, so it's real easy to mess this up and distort it. The most important thing, though, is I get my eyeball in line with the plane of the waterline. Now, I am putting very little tension on this. You do not want to stretch this tape much. So, very carefully. Now, the reason I was sitting down is to stabilize myself. Now, with my eyeball in plane, and I'm steadying my elbow, and I'm laying this down with very little tension. Okay, so now I'm going to lightly touch that, check it out, and that. That looks very nice. I think I might adjust this very slightly. That looks pretty good. So, uh, if you want a double water line, what, uh, what I do is I'll take another piece of tape. Let's say I'm going to do an eighth inch line of white and then an eighth inch gap and then another eighth inch tape. I will take another layer of this and I will go immediately on top. The reason for that 
is this tape becomes a gauge. It's an eighth inch thick. So if I come up one eighth, I've got an exactly parallel line. And then I put a third layer on top of that. That means three layers of parallel tape, and then I remove the middle one. So now I've got two perfectly parallel lines, okay? So I'm going to keep on going here, and uh, hopefully your project is coming along and you're having as much fun as I am. We'll talk to you later. Okay, I'm getting ready to put the contrast in color, and I'm going to teach you a very, very cool trick right now. Um, if you've ever done painting before with very fine lines, glossy paints, with contrasting colors, you've probably had a problem with paint color leaking under the tape. There is a surefire, easy way to fix that. Now, I painted white on here as the base, and I'm going to be putting the blue-gray on top of it. The first coat I'm going to put down is going to be the same white. The reason for that is that the white will leach underneath the tape and instead of having a contrasting color, you'll have exactly the same color. So the first coat of paint is going to be the same coat as the base. And then, once that's done, wet on wet, I'll go and put the blue-gray on top of that, okay? So anyway, just as a refresher, we've got this is defined by our water line. We've got an eighth inch gap, and that was done with an eighth inch piece of tape. Another eighth inch water line stripe. And then I've got a one sixteenth inch mylar. It's kind of hard to see because it's not very contrasting. But it's this 218 fine line mylar tape as a cove stripe. So next time we talk, we're going to have a blue gray boat. Go out there and have fun, guys. Bye. All right, T37 sports fans, this is the T37 with the uh, Stars and Stripes blue on it that I showed when I was uh, getting ready to spray the gloss. And you can see it came out pretty well. You can see that the lines are nice and crisp, and that was because I had sprayed it with the white before I sprayed the blue. And that meant that the white leached under the tape. Anyway... Things came out rather well. It's nice and shiny. And uh, there's a little dust in it. But all things considered, not too bad and uh, pretty acceptable. So hopefully this is going to inspire you to go out and spend some time sanding and doing a beautiful finish. All right, let's see you on the race course, guys. Bye.